to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. welcome to our study of isaiah's great commission in our text at hand, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is here confronted with the presence of God. What an awesome, soul-stirring event this must have been. In fact, it is this event, I believe, that totally changed the life of Isaiah. And as we approach today, the presence of God through prayer, through worship, and through Bible study we ought to feel as though Isaiah felt and feel commissioned just like Isaiah did. In this text, we're going to notice five life-changing events that took place in the presence of God, and just as they changed Isaiah's life, so they ought to change our life today to make us better servants and to better equip us to serve in the kingdom of the Lord. What did Isaiah do? What events took place? Number one, life-changing event, Isaiah had to contemplate God. Look at Isaiah chapter 6, and I want you to see verses 1 through 4. Isaiah says, or the Bible says, In the year that King Isaiah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Imagine being in Isaiah's shoes. Here Isaiah, he sees God high and lifted up and on the throne. Here's these great creatures cry out about the holiness of God. What is it that Isaiah saw? What is it he had to contemplate about God? Isaiah had to contemplate the character of God. Imagine the absolute holiness of God. Perfect purity that God himself is having never sinned, being the perfection of righteousness and holiness. Imagine being in the presence of God, what that would be like. Exodus chapter 5 verse 2 and in Exodus chapter 3, here's uh, Moses and Moses goes up on the mountain. He sees that burning bush and God says to Moses, take the shoes off your feet, the sandals off your feet. The place where you stand is holy ground. If the mountain where the bush burned that was only a, a picture of God, an image of God, imagine being in the very presence of God himself. What a life-changing event that would be. I want you to think about what is said in Jeremiah 29 and verse 13 concerning God. God said, you'll seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. To search for God to find him, to get that same contemplation of God that Isaiah had. We need to search for him. We need to find him, and he's not far from every one of us. I can see God in creation. I can see God in his magnificence, his power in this world, but I can also see him right here in the pages of the Bible. What else did Isaiah have to contemplate? Isaiah is impressed by the company surrounding God. In verse 2, you have the, the seraphim, these winged beasts of magnificence. Imagine being in the presence of such a beast created by God, and, and they're there to give God the glory and the honor. And no doubt Isaiah has to be thinking, how small am I compared to these? What magnificent creatures these are, and, and it is I whom God has called into his throne room. What an indeed awe-inspiring event that would have been. But then there's a third thing 
Isaiah has to contemplate about God, and that is the cry that he hears. One of these beasts cries out with a loud voice, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then the place was shaken, and the temple was full of the glory of God. Can you imagine being in a setting, in a scenario like that, how something like that would, would change your life and change who you were? Friend, when we stop and think about who God is, when I think that God is, is perfection, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 following, we're to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. When I think that God himself is, is what holiness is all about, be holy as he who called you is holy, 1 Peter 1, verse 15. When I'm reminded that without holiness, no one will see God. Hebrews 12, verse 14. When I contemplate really who God is, all of God's creation, and, and what I know to be true about God in the Bible, it ought to change my life to be better as a child of God and to serve God more faithfully in this life. But then there was a second life-changing event that Isaiah had to deal with, and that was Isaiah's not contemplation about God this time, but his conviction about man. Notice Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5. The scripture says, So I said, as, as he takes all of it in, soaks it up, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man, a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah here feels the, the conviction about who man is. Woe is me. Isaiah says, I'm in trouble. Woe is me. I'm undone. This is my undoing, we might say. Why? Because I'm a man of unclean lips. Isaiah is no doubt convicted about the sinfulness of man. Now, we're not saying that we're born in sin, for the Bible teaches that God made man upright, but we went astray. But what we do realize is the teaching of Romans 3, verse 23. Notice what the scripture says. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We realize, as Ecclesiastes 7 verse 29 teaches, that there's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. Even the most righteous would feel the, the trouble that Isaiah felt when he was in the presence of God. Isaiah 64 6 puts this spin on it. Even all our righteousness is like filthy rags. Why? Because we've all sinned and we all have been separated from God. What can we say at our best? What can man say at his best? Notice the words of Luke 17, verse 10. Jesus said, And you, when you've done all those things commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. At our best, what can we say? I'm only an unprofitable servant. I don't deserve. I'm blessed to receive what I have, but I don't deserve that. James 1.27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father, Father is this, to visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Isaiah is convicted about man and his sinfulness. But don't you know Isaiah was also convicted about man's lost state? The Bible teaches that without God, there is no hope. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10.31 says, For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12 verse 29. The scripture says in Ezekiel 18 verse 4, The soul who sins shall surely die. Like Isaiah, I need to be convicted about the sinfulness of man and man's lost state. But don't you know Isaiah had to also be convinced of God's love? The very fact that he was brought into the company of God, the very fact that although God is the supreme idea of holiness, Isaiah is a sinful man, the fact that God merges the gap and brings both of those together speaks volumes about the love of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Look at the love of God in the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. Notice these words. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6 says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Look at God's love for me while we were still sinners. Think about the beautiful words of 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. Jesus had it all, and he gave that up. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be made equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and he came on with himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Friend, think about how much God loves each and every one of us. Yes, I need to be reminded of sin. Yes, I need to be reminded of the lost state of sin, but also need to be reminded that it is God who merges that gap. Isaiah also had to be reminded and had to contemplate a confession to God. In Isaiah 6 and verse 5, I want you to again notice what Isaiah says. Isaiah says in chapter 6 verse 5, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Here Isaiah had to confess and acknowledge that, that man can't save himself. Throughout history, there are people who make this confession. Achan said it too late. I've sinned. David said, I've sinned. Saul said, I've sinned. I've erred exceedingly. I've played the fool. The prodigal son said, I've sinned. And he went home and made it right. Are we willing to say, I'm a man, I can't save myself, I need God's help, God's mercy, and God's grace. Jeremiah 10 verse 23 teaches that it's impossible for man to save himself. In the long ago, notice what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself, it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Here we're clearly taught that no matter how hard man tries, no matter what he does, man can't save himself. Instead of putting our trust in man, we need to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. But Isaiah here also has to not only confess he's a man, he confesses the holiness of God. Just as Isaiah made that good confession, so men today are taught to make the good confession about Jesus Christ. Romans 10 verse 10 says, With the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Look at what Jesus said about making the confession about Him. Matthew 10 verse 32, Jesus said, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I also will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men... Him I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And so just like Isaiah, we've got to make that good confession. We've got to realize God is from everlasting to everlasting. He's going to be God. Psalm 90 and verse 2. But then a fourth life-changing event occurs. Here Isaiah receives a cleansing from God. Look at Isaiah chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. The Bible says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Don't you know Isaiah's life was changed when that coal hit his lips? Well, what was that burning coal? What was that representative of? One of the things that a burning coal is representative of is the Word of God. In Jeremiah chapter 23, Jeremiah identifies that the Word of God is like that burning coal. Here's what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 23 and verse 29. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer 
that breaks the rock in pieces, when that burning coal from the tongs of the altar touched his lips, that was significant of God making a way through his word to Isaiah. And the same is true for us. God's word ought to be like a burning heart, a burning fire inside our heart. Luke chapter 24. Just like in Jeremiah's life, Jeremiah 20 verse 9, God's word was a burning fire shut up in his bones. So today, we've got to receive that cleansing from God. The cold touches his lips. God says, your iniquity is taken away. When the word of God comes to us, and when we obey that word, we also have that cleansing. But the cleansing doesn't come from coals under the altar. The cleansing comes by something far more precious, the blood of God's own Son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2 and verse 9, He tasted death for every man. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1, John, or 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, He's the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours alone, the sins of the whole world. He gave his life as a sacrifice. And when we come in contact with the blood of Christ, that's when we obey the gospel and we, when we become children of God. Now, how does a person receive that cleansing from God today? What must a person do to have sin purged in their life? Well, here's the good news. Your sin can be forgiven. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 28, This is my blood of the new covenant, which was shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. We can receive that forgiveness, just as Hebrews 8, verse 12 says. God said, I'll be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. How do we receive that cleansing? Where do we get forgiveness? By obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus asked a haunting question. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, he said to the Jews who thought they were the elite of the day, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? I must obey whatever God says concerning salvation to be right with Him. Well, what is it that God says a person must do to be saved? What must I do to be cleansed and my sin to be purged? I've got to hear the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, I know faith is essential, for Hebrews eleven six 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so I've got to have faith. Whatever way, therefore, faith comes is also essential. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. Once I've heard the word of God, then I must believe in Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 8, 24, Unless you believe that I am he, you'll surely die in your sins. Once I believe Jesus is the Son of God, I've got to be willing to repent and make changes in my life. Unless you repent, Jesus said, you'll all likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 5. Then I must make that good confession, just as Jesus taught in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, and just as the Ethiopian eunuch uttered in Acts 8, verse 37, I must be willing to say, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And having done those things, I then must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. I want you to see what Jesus said a person has to do to be saved, to be purged from sin. Let's let the master teacher tell us. Notice what he says in Mark 16, verse 16. Jesus came and spoke, or Jesus said, verse 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Jesus plainly taught, as plain as can be, that to be saved, to have sin purged, I have to believe, and notice the conjoining statement, and be baptized to be saved. How much clearer could God make his teaching about baptism? Don't question it. Don't say, well, why did God say that? That's not what God wants. That's not what Isaiah did. Isaiah, when those lips were touched to his coals, said, God, I didn't want you to do that now. That's too hot. He didn't say that. We need to simply obey what God says so that we can receive the cleansing from God. And then a fifth life-changing event, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 9, after his cleansing, Isaiah is now commissioned by God. 
Notice what happens in Isaiah 6 and verse 9. And God said, Go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. God asked the question, Who shall I send? Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. And then Isaiah says, Here am I. Send me. And God says, You go and tell these people what I've said. What a wonderful attitude. Isaiah had. Who shall I send? Isaiah stands up and says, hey, I've just been cleansed. I have now have new purpose and a meaning life. You, here am I, send me. And God says, okay, you go and tell them what I say. How wonderful it is that Isaiah heard that commission, but even more so that he received it as a personal responsibility, something that Isaiah himself could do and fulfill. When we think about the Great Commission, there are many things that come to mind. But I believe one of the clearest things we see is that the Great Commission is a personal commission. When God says go, God's not talking to my neighbor, and God's not talking to my friend only, and God's not talking to the preachers or the elders only. God's talking to me. Look at the words of Jesus in Matthew 28 and verse 18. The Bible says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he said, Go and make disciples of all nations. How we need to realize that the Great Commission is a personal commission for each and every one of us. You know, why is it that Jesus left heaven? Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17, 3, Restore that which we had from eternity. Jesus gave up heaven. He, he left God, separated from God. Why did he do all that? Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. And friend, if I'm going to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, if I'm going to imitate the Savior, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, then I need to be busy telling others about the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a, what a great privilege it is that we have the opportunity and the privilege to share the gospel with other people. Imagine this. Imagine that you had the cure to the world's most dreaded disease. Let's say that you found a cure for AIDS or a cure for cancer. Would you be quiet about that? Would you just sit on that and not tell anybody? Well, of course not. If you found the cure to that disease, you'd tell everybody you met, you'd get on TV, you'd get on radio, you'd stand and shout it from the top of the building. Why? Because this will save people who are suffering from those diseases. Friend, there's something far greater than suffering physically. People are going to die and perish for eternity in the fire of hell, and we hold in our hands the pearl of great price. We have God's power to salvation. We have the Word of God, which is able to save. And oh, how we need to take the Great Commission seriously. And so as we think about Isaiah 6, we think about the holiness of who God is. Let's ask ourselves, are we really living a life of holiness? Is my life and yours being lived as a life of holiness? Remember, Hebrews 12 and verse 14 says, Without holiness, no one can see God. Do I do things in my life that I know would make God unhappy? Is there sin or something in my life that is a defilement upon the beautiful garment of Christianity? As you think about Isaiah's commission or Isaiah's contemplation of God, Isaiah also had to think about his own state, his own sin. Each of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. As the scriptures teach in Romans 3 and verse 23, have we dealt with the sin problem? Maybe you are a child of God, but you've not taken seriously the commission and the privilege of serving the Savior in everything you do. You need to make that right before it's too late and make sure that you're living a life that is pleasing to God in every way. God is not going to be happy with just 90%. God's not going to be happy with 95%. God expects me and God expects you to give everything we have to His cause. Listen to the mindset of Paul. Paul said, 
I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul had realized in view of all that Jesus did, we need to live a life of faithful service to him each and every day. Just think how much God loves you and God loves me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 says, The love of Christ compels us. Why? Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and rose again. The Savior gave it all up so that I could have the hope of heaven and the joy of being a Christian. Now, if I'm going to take seriously the commission that God has given me, here are some things that I need to do. I need to first give myself to a study of the Word of God. If I'm commissioned to teach and preach the gospel, how I need to study this book. The Bible says study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Not only do I need to study this book, but I need to live my life in harmony with it. Do you remember what Paul said? Paul said, when I preach to others, I discipline my own body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I should become a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 26 and 27. But then we also need to have the courage and the determination of heart that this is the only way of salvation and I want to share it with others. Do you have that desire? Think about the people who are closest to you right now. Your neighbors, your friends, the people you work with, those people, if they don't obey the gospel, if they're not Christians and they don't obey the gospel, do we really understand that they are going to be lost for all eternity in the fires of hell? May the contemplation of Isaiah and the great commission that he's been given encourage each and every one of us to take seriously the great commission and spread the gospel to each and every lost person. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.